Welcome everybody to the very first Aleph Taf class of the online course, the first lesson. I'm super excited. Um, I must say I miss the normal Zoom when I can, where I can see everybody's faces because I see a couple of familiar names, um, friends and family, and it would, would have been lovely to see your face. At the moment, I only can see my own face and it's not that nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm so excited. Um, I don't know if any of you, I don't, I would like to see those of you who are already logged on. Um, if you, if you did the previous, um, the Aleph Tough course that I did on WhatsApp, um, is there anybody that started that course? You can just do your raise your hand icon. Um, but yeah, Aleph Tough is something that was born long ago. Um, I actually just want to share a short history with you um, of how I, yeah, it came to be for me to study Hebrew. Um, so this class is going to be very, very informal. And I think the goal is really to do Bible study together and for me to equip you and give you the tools to be able to um, just go deeper into the Bible. Um, so it was about um, in 2006, 2005, where me and my family, we just started asking so much questions about what we were taught in church. And um, we just realized we never really read and studied our own, own Bibles. Um, we just like received information from other people, but never really sat with the word and broke it open. And there were so many things that was misrepresented to us. And to me, it was very, very sad. Oh, sorry, I forgot to record. Okay. Sorry. Um, and it was just so sad to me that there was so much of the information in the Bible misrepresented to us. So I really started going into research and um, my personality has always been, I love, I love doing research. I want to know everything I want to understand. So I ask a lot of questions. Um, if somebody tells me this is how it works, I want to know, but, but why? And then I go look for myself. So I'm very curious by nature. And then I started going into the, the Hebrew, and I can't even remember, to be honest with you. Um, I can't remember how I first got to, um, the guy who wrote the book is called Jeff Benner. So I don't know how I got to his site, or, but I found him somehow online. So the guy that really inspired me and whose book I used to, um, to start my studies, he's called Jeff Benner. And he started the Ancient Hebrew Foundation or, or Research Foundation. I'll share the, his website um, on the group. Um, he also has lots of free nice videos and lots of books that you can order. Um, but yeah, I found him and then I ordered this book for me. So this was in 2006. So I imported the book from America. Um, I read it from the beginning to see, you know, how it works, how to use it. It's a Hebrew, ancient Hebrew lexicon. So how to use it to go deeper into the word. So nobody was able to teach me. I just had to figure it out myself. But um, I just, I can't describe to you the depth and the things I discovered. It was so amazing like I stood in awe so many times but I just couldn't believe how something um it's so hard to describe um it's really Hebrew is a living it's a living language and it's so rich and it's Abba's language um yeah so I was just amazed and Abba confirmed so many things for me even dreams I had and prophecies I had he, he would confirm it to me through this um ancient Hebrew. So through time, whenever I did a Bible study on a subject, and even now, if, if some of you have um, done my um, the, the disciple school, um, you know, any study that I do, somewhere I will go into a Hebrew word and I will look at the meaning because it will just break open a, um, the context of, of a verse of a chapter in the Bible. Um, 
So I use it all the time. So it's really more than just learning Hebrew. Um, like I've said to you, you know, even in the invitation, this course is not about learning to speak fluent Hebrew because I can't even speak a little bit. I know some words and, um, you know, modern Hebrew is very different and there's lots of very smart people. Um, I think even some of the people that are attending uh, this, this course that knows a lot more about Hebrew than I do. So um, please forgive me even when it comes to the, the, the pronunciation of some of the letters or the words if I don't get them correct. Um, I'm, I'm really not giving myself out um, as um, somebody who knows. Um, for me, it's really about breaking open the word. Um, if I can give a picture of myself prophetically, it will be a shovel. Um, Abba equipped me to dig and really to really go deep into the word. And especially in the Torah and to show people that if you start going into the Hebrew in the Torah, that the whole Torah is about Yeshua. It's just hidden and it's for us to find. And one of my favorite scriptures is the one that says that, um, you know, it's for kings to, to discover new and hidden gems in Abba's words and, and to seek them out. Um, so I just really want to equip you. And it, in the beginning, it's really strange, but it's practice, practice, practice. So um, I really believe that you all will get a hang of it. And there's really not a right or a wrong. Um, and I'm, um, what I'm going to teach you about each letter is basically going to be a guideline. But then after that, you know, you've got the Holy Spirit. He's the best teacher there is. And when you're sitting with a word, I mean, I, I don't get an interpretation for every word I look at. Sometimes it still doesn't make sense to me. And then I just leave it be there and I go pray about it. But at other times, I breaks it up. Oh, just so beautifully and so in the right time. Um, you know, he's the one who gives revelation. So it's not about how good your understanding is or um, about your, your, your ability to interpret. But, but you have to do this course and you have to use this method with the help of the Holy Spirit. Um, okay, so I just quickly want to show you. So... Um, Mine is very used and very old, as you can see. So this this is the ancient, yeah, <laughs> ancient Hebrew lexicon. So after 12 years, finally, I succeeded in importing these books. Um, but I didn't import many of them because I didn't know if they were going to sell. Um, I've had people in the past asking me and said they're interested, but they are quite expensive. Um, but Atava is selling them. So this is the book where everything's happening. Um, but I do want to encourage you, after this course, you, you won't need to, you don't have to buy one to be able to use this tool. And I'm going to show you how. I'm also going to, at the end of the course, give you like a printable um, poster, a table of each of the Hebrew letters. Um, with the meaning, with the numerical value. I'm going to design like our own little, um, of everything I said, like a um, summed up version that you can print out. And you will be able to use that um, as a basic guideline. You will still though have to then use the, um, the word on the strong concordance and then just... Um, translated from modern Hebrew to the ancient Hebrew. But I'll even put the modern Hebrew in that table for you. So I'll make it very easy. But if you want to save or whatever, we are going to sell this book. So, and I'll also show you how it works. So to just give you a quick sneak peek. Um, it looks like this. So you've got the different letters. This is where the letter Lam is starting. And then it gives, gives the different words. Yeah, but I'll show you exactly how it works. But this is going to be our study guide. This is what I use as a basis to work from. And then what I'm very excited about 
I also imported this book. It's from the same author. Yes, he he's got many other books and he also has many free books that you can download, um, e-books. I don't know if he's still... Uh, if it's still available, but back in the day, I was able to download the lexicon for free on his website. But go have a look. I'm going to share the link and you can see what is available for free. So this book is um, a new one from him. Um, and I'm also importing it. But it's a, a mechanical translation of the Torah. So I'm still working with this and studying it. But hopefully, maybe after this first course, we can do another one that even goes deeper. But I'll tell you a bit more about this and what it exactly is. Um, okay. Um, so are you ready to start? I see we are almost 18 people online. So I think that's all who's going to join us to, tonight. The rest are going to catch up on, um, on video. And yeah, just to let you know how it's gonna work. So with each um, Zoom lesson, we are recording it, but you just need to give us a bit of time because we just, um, we just capture it and then load it up to um, Vimeo. And then we'll share the link with the passcode on the group and it will stay there forever. So you will have access to these videos for as long as you would like. Um, to go through them again and again and again. Okay. So, um, okay. So the difficult thing with translations, I think many of you on the journeys that you have been on have found that there are mistakes in the translations. Um, and for some people, this becomes a big problem. I was also at that point where I was only uh, willing to read from certain translations. And I think it is important, you know, to be aware of the mistakes in the translations. But um, the, the problem with translations is when somebody is translating the Bible, it's just almost impossible not to interweave their own opinion into the translation. Um, and when somebody else who's, who doesn't know anything about Hebrew or what the original text says, they will quote a verse and they will say, but the Bible says this and this and this, or God says this and this and this. And in the end, you're actually just quoting, you know, an opinion. And that's why it became so important to me to really go and see, but what does the word say? What does it say in Hebrew? And um there's just many things I discovered that's not even in the most accurate of translations that's still not translated correctly. And for some people, this sounds daunting, um, but it should not. It's not about being um, theologically correct. It's just about really searching for the heart of Abba. And I believe that if I was stuck with even the worst of the trans translated versions, I don't know which one that is, but let's say this one with so many mistakes, with the worst translated Bible. If I was stuck with only that, I think I would still be okay, because it's Abba's spirit that gives revelation and knowledge and wisdom. Um, so, you know, I'm also sometimes just very afraid not to get stuck on the tree of knowledge. Um, like I said, there are many people who know more than me. Um, my heart is really, when I, when I break open a word, I want to understand what was Abba's heart, because I do believe that he is the creator of this language. Um, I do believe it's a heavenly, heavenly language. And um, yeah, so that is my heart with teaching you the ancient Hebrew. An example I want to give you is... Um, one of the examples I often use when I speak about the ancient Hebrew is um, when I started doing research about the law and the Torah, um, I realized that there are six, more than six, six or more than six words in Hebrew um, that's translated as law in English or vet in the Afrikaans translation. 
So when you read the New Testament and it speaks about the law, if you go back to the Hebrew thought and the Torah, you will find six different words with different meanings in different contexts that's just translated directly as law because the person who is translating it doesn't understand the, the, the culture of the Hebrew or they don't know how to interpret it dif you know, um, in a different way. For example, um, let me see. Here. A good example to give you is the word teach. So this is the example you also use in the me mechanical translation in the introduction. So there are six different texts in which the word teach is used. Um, in Exodus 18 verse 20, it says, teach them the ordinances. But in Hebrew, the Hebrew word that's used there is zahar, to advise or to caution. And so I can go through all six of these examples. And in each of them in English, the word teach is used to teach them the ordinances. Um, though one must teach them, I teach you my statutes and my judgments. And in each instance, it's a different Hebrew word that's been translated as teach. So for me as a study of Hebrew and wanting to know the deeper meaning, that's important to know, you know, when you realize, but it's not even the same word that's used here. Because if you go into the pictographs that's so full of meaning, it makes a big difference into what was Abba really trying to say. Um, so I'll give you a written example later. I'm just telling you the basis of this. For example, Another good example where the same Hebrew word is translated different as well. So it can go different ways. It can be different words translated into the same English word, or it can be the same Hebrew word that's translated into different um, Hebrew words. For example, the word that is used to describe um, Job and the word that is used to describe um, Jacob is the same. It's the same word, but in Job, you read that Job was a blameless man. And in Jacob, it's, uh, in, you, know, you, you read in Genesis that Jacob was a quiet man, that he dwelt in tents. So you get this picture about them and their character. But if you look in the Hebrew, it's exactly the same word that is used to describe them but they are translated different because the translator uses the context and then decides, okay, but this is a better suited word in English. But now if I go back and I see, okay, but it's the same Hebrew word that's actually used. And this Hebrew word means mature. They were both mature in their walk with Abba. Um, and that, actually makes a big difference for me about the character and, and who they are because you always think of Job as this blameless man who, does, who didn't have sin and he was um, you know almost sinless before Abba but if you look in the Hebrew it only says that he was a mature he was a mature believer walking before Abba and he understood how Abba's um, laws and government worked um, Another good example that somebody shed some light on not long ago, um, this is again the other way around. So it's not the same Hebrew word, but two different Hebrew words translated as the same one into English. So the Hebrew word for serpent is um, nachash, as it is found in Genesis where we read about Adam and Eve, um, yeah, who were deceived by the serpent. But if you read about Moses and Aaron, where they um, went to see Pharaoh, the word that's used there, you know, when they had the staffs and they had to throw them on the ground, is Danin. And it's translated as serpent, but it's actually a different Hebrew word. And the more correct translation would be a dragon. And this is very interesting information what to do with it i don't know yet but it's very interesting to me and 
you know, I understand that sometimes translators need to use the context to translate the verse for you, but I think at least they must make a footnote of it, you know, put it in bold or italics and say, yeah, this is the Hebrew, correct Hebrew translation, or this is what it means in Hebrew, or just give some exp explanation so that the reader um, has all of the information before them. Because the thing is, people make big life decisions and, you know, there are many religious disputes about about verses in the Bible, but then they don't even have all the information in front of them. So I hope that makes sense to you. Um, okay, let's continue. Um, so there's just a, a couple of basic concepts that I want to um, show you tonight, where we're going to start. We're going to start very slow. Um, but it's just, it's about Hebrew thought and how it's different from Greek thought. So our way of thinking comes from the Greeks and the Romans. And you really need to put on different glasses. Um, so this is really a beginner's course. If you know about a little bit about Hebrew, you know, this will be old news to you. So I'm just going to show a couple of slides and just stand still with each of them. Um, and explain to you um, yeah, why Hebrew thought is different than Western thought. So just give me a moment so I can get into the screen sharing. Almost there. So I'm going to try to do the sessions to um, leave the last 10 minutes for discussion and questions, if anybody has any questions. Um, after tonight, we will um, continue to do, we'll see how it goes and how much information we can fit into one, one hour. I don't want to, like I said, I don't want to overload you. When we started this course a couple of years back, um, what I'm sharing with you tonight was actually shared over three classes, over three WhatsApps a week, a week apart. So we went much slower for people really to digest it. Um, so we're going a bit faster, but I think, still think you'll be able to handle it. But if everybody says, listen, yeah, um, can we go slower? Can we only do like one letter a week? That's fine with me. And um, the weeks of the course will gen then just be adjusted. Um, but we'll work something out. So don't worry too much about will that cost more? Or how is it going to work? For me, it is important that you understand, that you follow. Um, yeah, and that you have time for this to sink in. Okay. So... Um, So you all know that in Hebrew, we, we read the text from, um, from right to left. So it's different than to English and Afrikaans and all Western languages. We read from right to left. Uh, right to left. So please just note the pronunciation that I will give to you during the course of words and of the letters. Um, we call it a phonetic transcription, okay? Because it's a different language that works in different shapes and forms, it doesn't use our alphabet. It's just um, a phonetic transcription. There isn't a correct or a wrong way to spell something. So if I say to you, everybody now has to spell Elohim, you know, in English, in English the way it sounds to you, you're probably going to end up with five different spellings. And there's no right or wrong. For you, there might be a more correct way to write it down so you can pronounce it more easily. But there's not a wrong spelling because it's only a phonetic transcription and it can be spelled in different ways. 
but the transcription is normal English or Afrikaans and you read that like you would any other word from left to right. So I think one of the biggest um, things you need to realize about the ancient Hebrew is abstract versus concrete thought and how that is different. Um, we got our Western way of thinking from the Greek people. They were very philosophical and we call that abstract thought. So they love they like to, to think about things and have theories. You know, maybe it could be this way or maybe it could, could be that way. Um, that is philosophical thinking. Let's just go. So abstract thought is like Greek philosophy. An example in the, in the word of this type of thought is Psalm 103 verse 8. It says, Yahuwah is compassionate and showing favor, patient and great in loving commitment. So it sounds like a very straightforward verse, but it's, you know, in being compassionate and showing favor, it's not something you can visualize or see with your physical eyes. It's not something you've physically seen before. So it's an abstract thought. So it's just an example of abstract thought in the Bible. Um, so it's important to know that Hebrew as a language is based on concrete thought, the culture as well, but that does not mean that there are no examples of abstract thought found in the Bible. So this is just an example of abstract thought. Okay, so let's go on to, I keep doing this, sorry. <laughs> um, Concrete thought, the, the more Hebrew way of thinking. So an example for that is the Psalm 1, verse 3. For he shall be as a tree planted by the rivers of water that yields its fruit in its season, and whose leaf does not wither, and whatever he does prosper. So yeah, the concrete thought, the, the picture that's given to you is that a person... Um, is planted by the river is for he shall be as a tree planted by the rivers of water so a person is likened to a tree um sorry just hold on a second oh no so now they say that you can't see me <laughs> let's try again Um, sorry guys, so now we're going to have to restart this. So you're all just still seeing me. Let's try one more time. <coughs> We've tested this <laughs> just before the um, lesson started and it worked because I was nervous about the screen sharing. So me and my friend tested it and it worked fine, but now I might have just not. It's, it's supposed to work now. Um, Charlene, if you can just let me know on WhatsApp if it's fine, if you guys can see the screen. And now. Um, sorry, um, Charlene. Just make sure that it's not just on your side that maybe you pinned my video. Um, okay, I see you all saying that you can't see me. 
Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to try one more time. Otherwise, we're just going to continue and chat about the principles because I don't want to um, waste too much time with this. She's screen. There we go. I think it must work now. I was supposed to click. <coughs> okay. Sorry, I'm a bit sick, so I'm coughing every now and then. Um, cause so let's quickly go back. <laughs> I'm just gonna go through the first couple. Okay, so the big main idea that I want you guys to get is the abstract versus the concrete thought. Okay, so we first quickly talked about abstract thought. Abstract thought you get in Greek philosophy. Um, they were, the Romans and the Greeks were into philosophy and thinking about ideas, coming up with alternative ideas or um, counter arguments, you know, it could be this way, but it can also be this way. Nothing was def definite. Um, so even though the Greek, uh, the, the Hebrew language and Hebrew culture and Hebrew thought is concrete, you still get abstract um, ideas in the Bible. Um, even though abstract thought comes from Greek philosophy, you still get abstract ideas in the Bible, but as a rule, Hebrew is more concrete. So an abstract thought, an example that I can give you is Psalm 103 verse 8. So if you want to write that down, that's the one that says, you're always compassionate and showing favor, patient and great, great in loving commitment. So it's not something physical that you can see and touch. Um, it's, you know, abstract, but I think you all get that idea. So let's look at the Hebrew. Um, Hebrew thought, an example of that is Psalm 1 verse 3. For he shall be as a tree planted by the rivers of water that yields its fruit in its season and whose leaf does not wither and whatever he does prospers. So the idea about concrete thought is what you can see, what you can touch. Um, everything is active. We'll get to that now. So here we can see that a person is likened to a tree planted by the rivers of water. So it's a lot of symbolism that's used. Um, and I think also you can see that coming through in the way that Yeshua taught. He used a lot of parables and symbolism, which is very... Um, um, kind of what's the word I'm looking for you know it's the way that the Hebrews were thinking in that time so I think that's why he used it a lot um, let's go to the the next principle so the first one was the different types of, of thinking that you get so important to remember concrete thought is a way of expressing ideas in ways that can be seen touched smelled, taste, tasted, or heard. Um, so the next point, oh, wait, wait, before we continue, I just want to share this with you. So let's quickly think about 
um, the word anger. So the word anger in English or in Afrikaans, like squat or I'm angry. If I say to you, picture anger, what do you see? There's not, you will probably see somebody's face getting red or steam coming out of their eyes. They always did that in the cartoons. Um, but each of us will probably have a different picture or an idea of how anger looks like. But anger is still kind of an abstract idea because it's an emotion. But in Hebrew, um, because there's no abstract thought, um, if you look at the word anger in Hebrew, it's called af. And if you look at the spelling and what it literally means, it means your nose. Because when somebody gets angry, he flares his nostrils to take in bigger breaths. You know when somebody breathes heavily when they are angry? That's what literally what the word for anger means in Hebrew. It means the nose flaring. So it gives you, when you read that word in Hebrew, immediately you get a literal visual picture of what anger is. It's not just this emotion, this thought that you might have a connection to visually through experience. You literally see the explanation of it in the letters. Um, and that's why if we go into the letters of the ancient Hebrew, um, it gives you a better idea because it's in the pictures. But the more you learn, the more you'll understand what I mean. Um, so in conclusion, on the first point, Abstract thought describes in relation to appearance or ideas, and concrete thought describes in relation to function. So for them, it's very important. What does a thing do? What is its function? I'll give you more practical examples just now. So the next point I want to teach you about is static versus dynamic. So in Western language, verbs express action, and nouns express inanimate or static objects. Um, oh my word, I keep pressing the wrong button. So Western language, verbs. Um, for example, it's to say that I run. Run is a verb, you all know about that. And noun is something that you can touch and feel, like a chair, a chair is something that you sit on. So you've got verbs and you've got nouns but in hebrew language verbs and nouns are expressed in actions um, and this is what makes it just so interesting to me so a good example is the word king um, the word king in hebrew oh, the word king in english is static while the word to reign is an action word in the english language but if we look at the Hebrew language, the word melech, um, if you ask somebody who knows a bit of Hebrew and you ask them, what does king mean in Hebrew? They will tell you it means melech. But if you go into the pict pictographs and the full meaning of the word melech, it means the king who reigns. So it's not just one word. It doesn't just mean king. It means the one um, the one, the king who reigns. And the word to reign in Hebrew means malach. And again, the fuller, more complete meaning of the word is the reign of the king. So it's also an action. So the king is not a noun and just, you know, a word for something or somebody. Um, everything is described in an action, active form. And it's just again for me to show that this, this, language it's, it's alive and you know and it's living um let me give you another example um so the hebrew word for mountain in hebrew um again it's not a static object in hebrew we in english a mountain something you can touch something you can feel um so if you've never heard of a mountain before, you've got no idea what it is. Um, somebody hasn't explained to you, they haven't given you a definition, and you hear the word mountain, you're not going to know what it is. 
But in Hebrew, if you look at the pictographs that make up the word for mountain, and you can interpret each of the letters, even though you've never heard of a mountain or you don't know what it is, you will still have an idea what it is about because the pictures will explain itself. So um, in Hebrew, the pictographs show that a mountain is more correctly translated as a head lifting up out of a hill. So if you look at each of the pictures, that is what it says to you. So if you've never heard of a mountain and you see the word mountain in ancient Hebrew, you will read the head lifting up out of the hill. And maybe then you'll see a mountain and you'll think to yourself, well, maybe this is because it does look like a head or something lifting up out of the ground. So um, it's actually just so more logical and, and basic to think this way. And we've unlearned it through the centuries. Um, so the third, third and last point I want to get across to you tonight. So first we had um, the abstract thought versus the concrete thinking. Then we had the, um, the second one, that's static and dynamic. And the third thing we're going to look at at is just basically the picture. So as you can see, even the logo of Olive Tuff in the left corner, it's pictographs. So that is what we call them. Come on. <laughs> there you go. So we're not going to use letters or the modern Hebrew. We're going to use the ancient Hebrew pictographs or glyphs. So it looks like the hieroglyphs that we always see in, in movies that the Egyptians use. And it's a representation of something, something familiar from that age, from that time. Um, we are going to do this in more depth next week, so I don't want to take away from the next class. But as an example, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet is called Al. So most of you know the basic Hebrew. Um, you will be more familiar with the modern name. It's called Aleph. Um, I use it in the title just because it's more recognizable to people. But in ancient Hebrew, we speak of the, the letter Al, just A-L. Um, and it's equivalent to the English letter A. So I'm just going to quickly go out and stop sharing so you can see my face again. There you are. Um, so if you, if you look at the ancient Hebrew, that is the head of the ox. So an ox was an animal they worked with almost every day. It was familiar and they knew it will be recognizable almost cross-culturally, even to other, other people that doesn't speak their language. So, um, yeah, it looks very straightforward. But why did they use the, the head of an ox? So the letter Al stands for strength because the ox was a very, very strong animal. And it also stands for another couple of things. But like I said, we'll go into that next week. But it's a very strong, you know, strong animal and it could do powerful things. It could work hard. Um, so the letter and the name of the letter and the pictures of the letter describes this animal. So even just with a basic picture, if you just saw this picture, you would immediately know it doesn't only speak of an ox, but it speaks of strength. It speaks of authority. It speaks of a leader. Um, and so it's like that for each of the letters of the alphabet. So they have, a, every picture has a symbolic meaning, but every picture also has a number. So Aleph is the first letter of the alphabet and its numerical value is one. So with each letter, we will also go into the numerical value. I will explain to you why and how I think this, you know, numerical value is um, correct or not correct. There are one or two that we, um, Jeff Benner um, differs from the more mainstream <laughs> Hebrew teachers on meaning of um, to associate numbers with specific letters. 
but nonetheless, um, if you did Martin van der Mavis, the dream course, he, he has a whole book on the meaning of numbers in dreams and stuff. And you will even see a correlation to that. So um, I think it's, it's about the, the principle of the meaning of the number. But I'll also show you like how to, um, to count the letters together to get the number from it as for a specific word. Sometimes when you have the meaning or the number, numerical value of a word, you can look that up and that word might uh, mean something more to you. Um, so a lot of people ask me about the ancient Hebrew and how is that different from Paleo Hebrew or modern Hebrew. Like I said, I'm, I'm really, I don't know much about modern Hebrew. I really would love to learn and I hope there is still a season coming for me to, to learn that. Um, and most of the information, the facts that I'm giving you for this course comes from Jeff Benner's book. He knows me. Um, I've spoken to him a lot before and he knows that I use his material and teaching and he's given his blessing for that because I also translate it into Afrikaans for my users. Um, but then again, I think later on, when you catch on on how to do the interpretations, I will give you more of my own studies about things Abba has revealed to me um, through breaking open these words. So I cannot tell you that much about how they found ancient Hebrew, but on his website, in, on many of his posts, he explains to you the research that he has done and how they have find, found old manuscripts and writings on rocks that showed the the ancient Hebrew and how it compares to the Paleo Hebrew. I mean, that's a whole nother <laughs> lesson on its own. And I don't want to, it's very interesting. And, you know, if you want to know more, I could send you the links and, or you can go search on his website. Um, but for me, that's not so important. I read it long ago and, and I really do believe that ancient Hebrew is the oldest form of Hebrew. And what I'll also do um, with each class, I'll show you the development of the letter. Like next week when we do Al and Beit, um, I'm going to show you this, this is what it looks like in ancient Hebrew. Um, this is how it changed to the early form of Paleo Hebrew. This is now how it's looking in the late form of Paleo Hebrew, and this is the modern Hebrew letter. And e even how it changed and was adapted into most modern languages we know. Um, I really believe that ancient Hebrew was the basis for many of the languages we have today. And I just don't think it's recognized. Um, anyhow, so yeah, you basically get four forms of Hebrew that we will discuss. Um, it's the ancient Hebrew, uh, Paleo Hebrew middle script, Paleo Hebrew late script, and then the, the modern Hebrew. Um, like I said, I'll give it to you in all three forms. Um, I'll give you the numerical value, and then we will also look, I'll give you one or two examples of words, um, starting with that letter. For instance, um, this is actually the one I usually use in the first lesson, but I'm going to use it tonight, and then I'll get a new word for the first lesson on Aleph. Um, but like I've said and explained to you that the letter... Oh, I've got an idea. Okay. You know the logo for Aleph Tav that I've used on the slideshow and also on the group? It's the head of the ox that I've just showed you. That's the first letter of the alphabet. That's called Al or Aleph. And then the Tav is next to it. So Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew Aleph, of the Hebrew alphabet. So you all know the Aleph Tav. Because that is who Yeshua said he is in Revelation. I am the Aleph Tav, or the Greek says the Alpha and the Omega. So if we look at the pictograph symbolism, like I've said, that the head of the ox can mean strength, it can mean power, it can mean authority, it can mean first. Um, it can also refer to the stronger one because Again, I'm sharing from next week's lesson, but I'm so excited. Um, again, when we look at the um, where, where did this concept come from for the letter Al? So when they used an animal 
um, an ox for, for plowing a field, okay? Um, they would usually, if they had a new young oxen that had to learn from an older one, they will tie them together because the older, stronger ox that knows what needs to be done and because he's stronger, he will pull the younger one in his direction. And in that way, he will teach him which is the way to go and how to do the plowing. So you are yoked with a stronger one to teach you. So even the word al means the stronger one, the stronger one of the two. So who is, who is our stronger ox? Who is our stronger partner in covenant? It is Yeshua. And that is exactly what the second letter means from Aleph Tav, the Tav. Tav means the mark or the covenant. So even with this small combination, the Aleph Tav, it can mean I am the stronger one of the covenant just by looking at those two letters. He is our ox that teaches us. It can mean the strong covenant. It can mean the powerful mark, the mark of the covenant. Um, so that is how alive um, this language is. And it's so deep to me. And it just, yeah, it just breaks it open. And we will have a whole lesson on the Aleph Tav. Um, that little word is just such an amazing word that, that you first find in Genesis 1 verse 1, and it's not even ever translated because it's more used as a, um, um, you know, it's more used for grammar um, than a physical word. So they don't translate it, but it has so much meaning. And when I break that open to you, I know you will just be so astounded. And I think many of you have heard the teaching of the Aleph Tav. But basically, that is my introduction for tonight. Um, it really feels so funny not to see faces and to just be speaking for so long just to myself. But I hope you enjoyed it. And let's see if there's any questions. Um, I would really love to hear from you. So if anybody has a question, you can just, on the bottom of the screen, there's a little box that says, um, Q and A, and you can just type it in there. We're going to use that throughout um, yeah, the whole course um, to talk to each other. And I think it's, it's important to ask questions. I always say um, the only bad question is the question not asked. So um, like I've said, my heart is to do at least two letters every week if we can get to that. And then I will try to fit in as many examples of words in each lesson so you can learn how to decipher it. And then we'll look at some texts and verses where these words are used. So you can see how it breaks open a verse. And then there will, I think, be one or two extra um, classes left at the end of the course. That's not booked yet. So I'm going to ask Abba, but there I think we will do some in-depth study of a word or of um, a chapter. I'm going to pray about it and see what it gives us. Um, so you can really understand how to, to go deeper. And then if, if it's Abba's will and he gives us more time, I would love to do a second course and really go like into a book, um, you know, in-depth like into songs of solomon or one of those books and and really go look at the the hebrew in that and to break that open for you um for those of you who don't know um about the passion translation um i really i'm enjoying that translation so much it looks like the author really also looked into the hebrew and he understands Hebrew thoughts. So he just translates it in such a beautiful way. Um, you know, when I first got my Passion Translation and I read through um, Songs of Song, I cried so much because for the first time that book just, he just, he just, he broke it open so beautifully. And it was as if that what I see in the Hebrew as if um, he just made it available in English to understand. 
the, the you know the Hebrew thought. So if you if you don't know about from the, the Passion Translation, please get it. It's it's on the um let me just see what's this app called. The Holy Bible app. They call it U version, the Holy Bible app. Uh, I don't think you'll be able to see. I'll share I'll share the name on the on the group as well. But it has the Passion Translation module in the app that you can download for free, but you can also buy them at Kumbooks. So that's a very nice translation that's very similar to the Hebrew that I've seen. And when I'm not doing like in-depth study and I'm praying word, I also like to use the Amplified Bible because the Amplified, um, you know that they usually have a word and then in brackets there's an explanation. Um, it's very similar to the Hebrew as well for me. Um, I get much more out of it than any other English translation. Um, it's much richer. But anyhow, um, yeah, I think that's our time for tonight. Oh, there are questions. Yay. Okay, so somebody asked me <laughs> to share the link for Jeff Benner. I'm going to share that on the um, Telegram group. So you can just click out of that. I'll just share um, the link for his website. And um, I'm also going to share the prices for the books on there. It is on our price list, but we'll just share the price list there. There's just one of things, one or two things I want to change on the price list, um, new products that I need to add, but I'll share the prices of the books so long for you. Um, like I said, I only have, I think, five books available of the Ancient Hebrew Lexicon. Um, but it really was quickly. So if we are sold out, please just put down your name. We're going to put in a new order and order some more from overseas. I didn't want to order too much and then it doesn't sell, but it doesn't take long. Um, okay. Somebody says here, they got their passion translation at Kumbooks on special for 280 at Mainland Branch last week. So if anybody doesn't have a passion translation, um, thank you. I'm so happy to see the people say that you enjoyed it. Um, uh, okay. Okay. I'll read through some more of the, the comments. And if there's any question I missed, then I'll just answer it on the group or, or next week. So super excited. I'll see you guys next week. Please have a notebook ready. I'm sure you already do have. Um, we're going to start with Aleph Bet. That's the first two letters. And isn't that interesting? That's where the name alphabet comes from. So I'm, I'm really convinced that ancient Hebrew um, or Hebrew was one of the first languages where all other languages come from because it's Abbas language language so the alphabet or the aleph bet is the alphabet so we look at those two letters um and aleph bet as you all know is also the word af which means abba or father so that's super special you must all have a blessed evening you must sleep tight and yeah i've just got so much excitement in my heart i feel so close to all of you and i really hope we can become long-time study partners. You must have a blessed night. Wait, wait, I see there's two more questions. Um, what is the CFR? Okay, so I'm just quickly gonna answer that. Um, so the CFR, wow, what an interesting book. I haven't read much of mine. I also ordered that. Um, I don't know if you saw that on our price, price list now and you're asking. Um, I don't have mine here. I'm not at home. Um, but the CFR is also people who did a translation of the Torah, but not also, but not only of the Torah, also of the apocryphal books that were taken out. Um, I really enjoyed the research. I've read some of the research in the front of the book that explains what is the apocryphal books and why did they take them out. Um, and they give you a, a bit of the, the history of when and how the scrolls were found at um, Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And um, I've read versions of some of the apocryphal books previously, 
it wasn't nicely translated. It didn't read like a biblical, old biblical book. But the CFR, um, that book reads very nicely. All the books read the same. And for me, it's, it's good to read them once to see, um, you know, what are those books and what do they say? So yeah, the CFR just means writings or holy writings. So it's just another word for, um, yeah, for the, the writings from Abba. I hope that answers your question. Okay. I think that's it. So you must all have a blessed evening. Sh uh, shalom. <laughs> Bye.